posted to turn it around. Tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care. The greedy corporations determine who survive. Can we give just the wealthy the right to stay alive? Go tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care. In hospitals and clinics, the poor are turned away. The system won't provide for the ones who cannot pay. Go tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care. And welcome to Heal DC. This is Joni Eisenberg. It is August 12th, 2024, and this is our first Monday in our summer pledge drive. We are talking, as we've had for many decades, about the need for true national health care in this country and the forces that are trying to block that. We have a, a, a health care hero on with us for the hour who I'm going to introduce in a moment, Dr. Edwin Chapman. Uh, and he'll be talking about uh, the recent National Medical Association convention where they talked about the corporatization of health care. Uh, later in the show, we'll be joined with health activists, with organizing uh, for a union uh, at local clinics, Unity Healthcare, and much more. But we want to remind you that today is our first uh, Monday on the Pledge Drive. I don't know if Katia is there to join me yet, but we have a goal this morning on this show of $800. And we can only do that with your support and your help. You can be the first to jump on and make a pledge 202-588-9739, 202-588-9739. Or you can pledge online on our website, wpfwfm.org. You can scroll to make a pay, to make a pledge to Heal DC. But we're all in the same family, so wherever it goes winds up in the same pocketbook as we need your support. Uh, you can also ple- do a um, cash app, and somebody will tell me later what the, our new cash app uh, is. <laughs> but right now, um, we look forward to your support. As you know, we cannot do this without you. We are basically all volunteers. I've been volunteering for over 30 years, uh, and mostly everyone on air are volunteers, and we come to you in support of the community. So with that, I am happy to introduce our guest for the hour, Dr. Edwin Chapman, who has, who has practiced medicine in DC for over 40 years. He specializes in, in internal medicine and addiction medicine, and he is basically a hero in the area of addiction medicine and more. For the past 20 years, he's been investigating the complex mix of addiction, uh, uh, untreated mental illness, infectious disease, chronic diseases, and criminal behavior, and in which patients have 20 to 25 years shorter lifespan. And Dr. Chapman has indeed been investigating that. He's a graduate of Howard University College of Medicine. He completed an internship and residency with a fellowship in cardiology from the historic Freedman's Hospital and Howard University Hospital. And I must say he is an activist doctor committed to the people. He is takes off from our own Dr. Jesse Barber, who helped to found this program um, many decades ago with us back in the 90s, uh, who's a hero in, in health care. Dr. Chapman is very much like Dr. Barber, and that he's committed to the people. 
He's also a member of the WPFW family, often heard not only on this show, but on Ambrose's Lane show, Mondays at 5, and Roach's show, um, Tuesdays at 10 a.m. So we're going to be hearing from Dr. Chapman first, and then later in the hour we're going to be hearing uh, an update of what's going on in, in D.C. Uh, regarding corporatization of health care uh, with the Unity Clinic. But I'm very pleased and happy to welcome. Uh, good morning, Dr. Chapman. Hey, Johnny, we're still trying to get him to connect to his audio. I'll let you know when. <laughs> okay, he has a lot to say. Uh, some of you may be aware of the National Medical Association, which was uh, founded, I believe, in the late 1800s. And you can perhaps guess why, because uh, black physicians were not allowed to join the white uh, American Medical Association. The NMA has a very historic, um, has played a very historic role, which changes from time to time, but it, it is really back in the driver's seat with playing a leading role uh, in what's going on with the increasing corporatization of healthcare. And Dr. Chapman just um, participated last weekend in the uh, NMA's na uh, annual convention in New York City, and he uh, was very pleased that the focus was really an in-depth look at the privatization, the increasing corporatization of healthcare. This, of course, is not new, but it continues uh, each year to, to get worse. Uh, and we've talked, uh, we've had many shows talking about Medicare Advantage, which, of course, uh, we call Medicare Disadvantage. It is, um, I hate to say, it, it's helping to, it has the potential for destroying the true Medicare program, which was passed uh, thanks uh, in part to mobilizing from the civil rights communities, uh, black physicians and more. Medicare was passed. But uh, the, the powers that be and the moneyed interests are doing everything they can to, to really severely weaken Medicare uh, so that it is no longer what it was supposed to be. And I do hope that Dr. Chapman uh, <laughs> is, is going to join us. Uh, we've saved this time for him. Uh, Mike, perhaps you can call him on the phone if, if the Zoom is not, is not working. Um, He's connected. Okay, he's on. Dr. Chapman, you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Glad to hear you. I was I was saying everything I was hoping you would say. I was sharing uh, about your recent um, experience with the National Medical Association and the recent convention. Uh, anything you want to add about the history of the NMA? I'm sure some listeners don't know about the NMA? Yes, so the uh, uh, National Medical Association was organized uh, uh, before 1900, and uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, black physicians uh, were not uh, allowed to uh, join the American Medical Association then. So it's the uh, oldest African American uh, medical association uh, in the world. And uh, uh, we just had uh, a recent convention uh, in New York City, um, and uh, I had the privilege of attending uh, the community health uh, sessions, but also a plenary session uh, that talked about uh, what uh, they described as uh, big medicine, uh, really talking about uh, how uh, corporate America has uh, taken over health care. And give us some examples. I know you were sharing with me the, the severe danger that this galloping corporatization um, is having uh, on, of course, patients, but also on physicians, particularly black so, physicians, but, but all physicians. Yeah. So uh, back in about 1970, um, there was a uh, move towards uh, what were called uh, 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 HMOs or health maintenance organizations, but corporate America realized how much uh, money was involved in healthcare and the fact that uh, at that particular point in time, they had very little uh, input in the direction of uh, how this money was spent. 
So uh, for the past uh, 50 uh, years or so, uh, corporate America has uh, spent an enormous amount of time uh, in, in inserting itself uh, in the management of health care. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, outcomes uh, have not uh, improved. And uh, it's because you have uh, investors, hedge fund investors, et cetera, who are there simply to make money, not to uh, uh, provide uh, services. And when those uh, monies are extracted from the system, uh, obviously somebody gets hurt. And uh, it's generally, uh, or, or not generally, but it's the folks on the front line who are actually doing the work. So we're seeing hospitals close. We're seeing uh, medical practices close, uh, uh, community practices, uh, and uh, more and more the takeover of uh, corporate America in terms of running uh, health care. And it's, uh, as I said, it's not uh, necessarily uh, driven uh, by by better health outcomes. And we're seeing it in our communities uh, that people are getting sicker uh, uh, without uh, uh, costs are going up, uh, but services are going down. Absolutely. And I must admit, I'm old enough to remember those early 1970s when President Nixon was in office and I first read about what they were planning to do with these HMOs. And here we are 50 years later and it's still um, a major threat to our right, what well, should be a right for health care in, in the United States. So give an example, Dr. Chapman, of how this particularly is uh, impacting black physicians more and more and what was said at the NMA convention about that. Yeah. Uh, so one of the most uh, astounding uh, statements was made by uh, one of three panelists uh, at our plenary session who mentioned the fact that uh, uh, 90 to 95 percent of uh, uh, African American uh, graduates from medical school will probably be looking for a job rather than uh, opening an office. Uh, and that's uh, uh, in and of itself is uh, earth shaking. When, when I was in medical school, uh, of course, we were uh, looking for uh, an opportunity to, to hang a shingle uh, uh, as a private practitioner uh, in the community. Uh, but that's how uh, drastically uh, this whole uh, corporate corporatization uh, of healthcare uh, has changed things. So people are really bound uh, to this system, uh, and this system, again, uh, is driven by, by profits and not uh, uh, productivity. Absolutely. And unfortunately, it keeps getting worse and worse. I remember in the 90s when uh, Medicaid, all of a sudden, um, they were busy privatizing uh, Medicaid with these managed care organizations. And of course, uh, I'm not sure if it's true. It's pretty much true across the country, definitely true in in D.C. that most Medicaid patients are are pushed uh, or, or must go into a managed care organization, which is a for-profit entity. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a nonprofit as we used to have in the day. Um, I'm not sure if they, if they talk much about the impact uh, on Medicaid programs at the NMA, but it's, it's certainly uh, a concern as, as we'll hear um, a little later in the show. You know, so certainly uh, our patient population uh, is disproportionately uh, a Medicaid population or a Medicare Medicaid population. Uh, and because of uh, this structure, uh, it becomes an easy target for corporate America to uh, implement uh, uh, policies uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that they write uh, uh, that are uh, not uh, really regulated by uh, the government. And that's the whole idea, is to uh, uh, create what's called regulatory capture, where uh, the corporations write the rules for the government. 
And uh, uh, if you look at some of the studies that uh, HHS uh, Inspector General has recently uh, uh, put out, uh, they show that, for instance, uh, in 37, they studied 37 states, and out of those 37 states, 25, including the District of, uh, of Columbia government, uh, have no regulatory oversight over the, uh, the Medicaid managed care organization. Uh, they mm. simply come in, uh, uh, present their program, and uh, 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 claim that uh, whatever the outcomes are, poor outcomes that are uh, presented are, are not their fault, that uh, they're basically the fault of the uh, patients uh, not taking advantage of the services. But I think as we dig deeper, uh, we can see that, uh, again, uh, uh, in many instances, we don't have the networks of providers that are needed, and uh, those networks of, of providers are not generally geographically uh, uh, available or spread out in the community so that patients can access uh, uh, services. So, so it's really a catch-22 that um, uh, uh, the corporations have, uh, have pretty much bought off, off the politicians uh, uh, to look the other way. And uh, so we're really going to have to fight as professionals from the bottom up. And I think that's why we're seeing uh, some of the uh, movement uh, particularly uh, here locally with uh, uh, providers now unionizing uh, because they want to do a good job, but they also want to have uh, fair working conditions. Absolutely, and we'll hear from them in a little bit. But um, Dr. Chapman, I don't know if you know, I used to know how much many millions of dollars these for-profit managed care organizations in D.C. are making. How much profit are they uh, raking in? And and you're saying that I used to think that the the Medicaid agency had some oversight over these for profit agencies, but you're you're saying they don't. Do you know off the top of your head how much how much profit they make off of low income people from so, our so tax if you if you can imagine the District of Columbia. Overall budget is now twenty billion dollars. Five billion dollars uh, is is spent on health care, and uh, most of most of those dollars are Medicaid dollars. So if you could imagine, close to five billion dollars uh, is spent uh, every year on health care in the District of Columbia. Yet we have uh, some of the worst outcomes for uh, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, we were number two behind uh, West Virginia in uh, per capita overdose deaths uh, uh, due to opioids. Uh, uh, renal failure uh, is uh, at the District of Columbia is at the top of the list. And, and all of this is the result of patients not getting uh, access to preventive health care. And, and so I think you can see how this picture is developing uh, with physicians now pushing back and really talking about the complexity of the patients that they have to treat. But if you don't have a workforce uh, uh, comparable, uh, able to deal with that, there's plenty of money in the system. But I think we'll see again that money is being sucked out of the system uh, by these investors and by uh, 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 corporate uh, 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 operatives uh, or or uh, the corporate uh, generals in, uh, uh, in and of themselves. So you'll see people making big salaries to manage uh, these managed care or organizations, but not the uh, outcomes uh, on, on the front end. Oh, and it, it, this is, it's of course, infuriating that the District of Columbia, as you just said, is, is, is uh, raking in. Uh, or spending five billion dollars for Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid low-income patients, and yet we continue to have uh, some of the worst health outcomes in the nation. Uh, we need to continue to build a movement. We, you know, unfortunately, I've been, I, I, many of us have been talking about this for decades. We sh started the show in 1990. 
two with Dr. Jesse Barber and Michelle, uh, but it, it continues to get worse. And we know what we have to do, folks. We have to build, continue to build a movement. We are uh, in the first Monday of our summer pledge drive. I don't know if Katia is with me. I can't, I'm not on Zoom. I can't see who's there, but we have to uh, ask people. We're asking people to make a pledge to this show. Uh, and if Katia is not there, Mike, maybe you can tell us if we've had any pledges. Joni, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm right yes. here with you. And good morning to you and your esteemed guest, Dr. Chapman. It's an honor uh, to be on with you. And, um, you know, again, this is the information that um, To Heal DC and Joni Eisenberg has brought to the listeners all of these decades, and we so appreciate her contributions on and off the air to ensuring that public health is truly for the public, for the people. And today's show is no exception. So we ask you to go to the phone right now and pledge your support. The number to call is 800-222-9739. We have a goal now of $700, Joni, because uh, uh, from Thomas and his sonny, Says, mm-hmm. say keep up the great work so they made a contribution <laughs> and they made it online at wpfwfm.org you can do the same so we are in need of $700 for this hour now and we ask you to go to the phones and make that call that makes the difference Joni you were right we have a brand new cash app it's dollar sign wpfwfm that's dollar sign wpfwfm so if you have your phone handy and um, we all know the Cash App is it, just too easy, really, to use these apps to send money. Cash App is no exception. But you'll be doing something great for yourself and something wonderful for your community when you use it to donate to WPFW. So, again, we ask you to go to the phones, make that call that makes the different support that which supports you. And Joni does that week in, week out, 800-222-9739. Or you can go online to WPFWFM.org. Joni? And Katia, when you use the cash app, I think it's good to put down uh, maybe the per- the donor's name and the show that they're donating to. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. You should put that in the notes section. That's absolutely right, Joni. That way we mm-hmm. can credit uh, to Heal DC and we will know who has made the donation because sometimes only the email address comes up. So if you just include your full name and that way uh, we'll be able to communicate uh, with you. And again, most importantly to heal DC and Joni Eisenberg will get the credit there. Again, if you want to use the phone number, that's 800-222-9739. And um, you can go online as well to WPFWFM.org to make your generous pledge of support. Uh, be- think about becoming a sustaining member this morning. Yeah. Uh, there's someone out there, Joni, as you know, that can do that and take care of the entire 700 with a sustaining pledge. You can do that in the amount of as low as $10 a month, $20, $50, $100, dollars whatever suits your budget. We also say many hands make light work. So consider making a donation of five, 10, 15, 100, 200, a thousand dollars. Again, whatever suits your budget. And Joni, just like public health, we remind folks that there are those in our community that vitally need the information that WPFW can provide, but they don't have the means to support financially right now. So when you make a pledge of support, when you're in a privileged position to actually be able to make a financial contribution, you are not only doing that for yourself, you're doing that for those who cannot make a contribution right now, but rely on the information that WPFW provides. Yes, and Katia, as you and I both know, and many listeners know, we this country is spending countless billions of dollars. I, I hate to say it to kill people. So yeah. we're not asking we're we're asking you to help us all kill keep people alive and healthy, and we need your money to do that because unfortunately, uh, this government of ours is not doing that at all. They're, they're using them, our money to, to kill people. <laughs> um, it's not funny, exactly. but it's all the world. Um, and, you know, we have, we're thankful for Democracy Now! and this station, which gives us the horrific news every morning. But we want to try to take some steps forward 
in saving lives, and we do that on this station. Uh, so again, Katia will come back in a few, about 15 minutes or so to ask for your help again. I want, I want to especially thank Thomas Blanton and Hassani. Hassani was part of our original team of To Heal DC with Dr. Jesse Barber many decades ago. So she's been with us all along. So Katia, now we're going to move uh, when Dr. Chapman will remain with us through the hour. Again, this is an hour where we're focusing on the corporatization, ongoing corporatization of healthcare, and we're spending the next uh, segment uh, talking with two activists who are very much involved with what's going on uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're glad to have Carrie Lane, who's been on with us before. Carrie is the Northeast Regional Director of the Union of American Physicians and Dentists, uh, the union that represents the largest number of medical providers, particularly physicians. Uh, and he is definitely an organizer committed to the people. We're also thrilled that we could have on one of the physicians uh, involved with Unity Healthcare's uh, struggle, and we're going to hear about that from uh, Kate Sugarman. Dr. Sugarman is a family physician. She graduated in 1991 from Montefiore Hospital in my hometown, New York City, uh, focusing in social medicine. And Dr. Jesse Barber was one of the founders of that field of social medicine. Uh, Kate Sugarman is an activist. Uh, with the union of uh, uh, that we just mentioned, Union of American Physicians and Dentists, and much more. And we're going to hopefully have a few minutes to hear about some of the other things that Dr. Sugarman is involved with, separate from organizing around uh, what's happening at Unity. She currently practices at Upper Cardoza, and uh, we look forward to hearing from her. So welcome, uh, Carrie Lane and Dr. Sugarman. You both there with us? Yes, I'm here, and um, I'm ready to speak whenever people want me to speak. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Sugarman, why don't we start briefly with you, and then we'll jump to Carrie. Tell us, what is Unity Healthcare, and um, a little bit about its history and who you serve, and then, of course, we'll jump into the crisis that's undergoing now. But first, tell people what, what Unity Healthcare is. Okay, so Unity Healthcare is, um, the uh, technical term is called an FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center. So we get support from the federal government, of course, from the D.C. government. Also, our mission is to provide uh, compassionate medical care for the low-income, the vulnerable uh, patients of D.C. We also have the mandate uh, to provide uh, medical care for unhoused um, people, so that there are street outreach, street outreach teams and uh, also in uh, providing care in the uh, homeless shelters for D.C. My understanding is that many decades ago, the D.C. government was providing primary health care to um, or had the uh, mandate to provide primary health care to unhoused people in um, D.C. And um, and the, the Unity government outsourced uh, the provision of primary health care to Unity Health Care. So Unity has the obligation to provide um, health care to D.C.'s poor. I believe that Unity serves about eighty to 90,000 patients within the district. Another way of looking at that is that one out of eight um, uh, people in D.C. get their health care through Unity Healthcare. They also provide the health care for the DOC, the jails, the Department of Correction. And can I jump in now to the current crisis? Would this be a good time? Yes. Yeah, so just mention, and Carrie, maybe you could mention this, where are these clinics? I know they're all throughout the city, including Ward 7, Ward 8, Ward 5. Um, and, of course, uh, Upper Cardoza is there in Ward 1. So, again, it, it serves a great uh, span of the city and the people who are really in need of health care. So, yes, Kate, jump in and share um, the crisis that is currently going on at Unity. Okay, I'm going to um, just start from the kind of like a, give a little bit of background. So I want you to um, think back to being home during the lockdown in March, um, about March of 2020. 
the clinic, uh, you know, everybody was told to stay home. So at first there were very few patients. The clinic looked empty, but we were working, working, working. We had a swiftly transitioned to telemedicine and then, and then the patients with COVID started pouring in. So we had, um, you know, tents outside, hot weather, cold weather, rainy weather. We were testing people, um, putting our own health at risk, uh, you know, in the, um, for, you know, right, uh, jumping right into the COVID crisis. How were we thanked for putting our health in jeopardy, for working so hard, both remotely and in person? How were we thanked? The uh, corporate management told us that we had to dramatically increase the number of patients we were seeing, dramatically increase the number of patients, even though we were working to the bone. As a result, um, we unionized. Uh, we had a union vote, and uh, with UAPD, we won by an overwhelming majority, and management just continues to retaliate. So due to um, all the uh, really unfair working conditions, there has been a hemorrhage. There has been an exodus of doctors and medical providers uh, to the point now where, um, you know, a lot of the clinics are empty. Upper Cardozo is a four-story clinic in the heart of Columbia Heights. We have, uh, you know, vulnerable patients, low-income patients, immigrant patients, and the building is empty. It looks like a ghost town. Providers and doctors keep leaving, um, and management even admitted that they cannot replace the providers who leave because we pay Pay under market. We are underpaying, um, you know, the providers, expecting them to see um, an unfair number of patients, and um, the building is empty. And um, patients keep asking me, "Will you be my primary care doctor?" Their doctors leave. We had a doctor leave uh, last month. She had been with us for twenty four years. Who was going to see her patients that she was seeing for 24 years? People ask me, will you be my uh, primary care doctor? What can I say? I can't say no to somebody, but that means that I won't have room to see my own patients. My own panel is already over overly filled. Um, my, my only conclusion is that the corporate management wants us to close. I don't know what else to think. Uh, patients are told the only way they can get an appointment, you know, come at 7 a.m., wait in line. People come as early as 6.30 or earlier. And by 8 a.m., all the slots are filled. Um, we frequently get emails that there's a clinic that has no doctor for the day. Who can fill, who can fill those slots? And management, they, they think they're solving the problem by hiring temps. So they go to temp agencies in, in an attempt to get temporary doctors, but then patients no longer have continuity of care. They no longer who, they no longer have a doctor who knows them, who knows their history, who they've developed a relationship with. Um, so we are in severe crisis. And where is the D.C. City Council? They know about this crisis. Where are they? Why are they not pressuring unity? Why is this corporate management allowed to drive the clinic over a cliff? And, of course, many of us remember what the what <laughs> leadership in the city did to help Shut down D.C. General. We remember that. Uh, that So this is kind of a, unfortunately, this is not new, but it remains uh, frightening. And Carrie, I heard that uh, two physicians, uh, I don't know if this is official yet, but recently uh, quit at uh, the Anacostia Clinic. Um, do, you, do you have anything to add about the situation, particularly with some of the East of the River Clinics and Ward 5, Ward 7, and 8, what's happening there? Or anything you'd like to say, Carrie? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I, I think just to pull back a little bit, I think the fact that uh, the uni unity providers had to organize and uh, unionize in the first place tells you how bad the situation is. Um, and, you know, instead of using this as an opportunity to improve, unity is hired um, a union busting law firm, an expensive elite union busting law firm, Littler Mendelssohn, who represents uh, corporations like Starbucks. Um, they're paying them from the balance sheet, which is seeded with taxpayer money, which itself is ethically uh, questionable. Um, and what we're seeing is at the bargaining table, as you know, um, we try to we're we're trying to get these guys a a, a fair. Uh, dignified workplace here so they can do what they do best, which is provide a quality care to underserved patients. And what we've been running into at the bargaining table 
is um, sort of, uh, you know, gaslighting and bait and switch tactics and delays and withholding of documents uh, that we uh, have access, that we have legal access to. Um, uh, they, they'll, they'll offer an improvement, uh, one bargaining session and then pull back that improvement, the next bargaining session. So, so not bargaining in good faith. And so we're at a point, uh, where, uh, strike authorization is a possible step. Um, it, we, as, as Kate mentioned, uh, we need the support of the community and, uh, to keep pressure on our elected officials, uh, to help us with this. Um, and to your, and to your question, uh, Joni, you know, 20, we're, I think we're up to 28 full-time providers who have resigned in the last six months. Um, and most of those have not been replaced, as, as Dr. Sugarman mentioned. And, you know, we're starting to see this, uh, and the fact that these providers are not being replaced, we're starting to see uh, this ineptitude by managed, by unity leadership. It's starting to show in their finances. And from what finances we have, unity is now operating at, at an they're operating at an operational deficit. And uh, of course they are, because uh, when you're not seeing patients uh, and when 28 providers uh, uh, quit and you can't see uh, patients, you can't bill insurance. So um, what we're seeing is in the, in the unity finances, although they have a base of their balance sheet is healthy from prior years, they're, they're operating at a deficit now because all of these uh, providers have quit and they have not been replaced. So, um, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's like what Dr. Chapman was saying earlier. We're seeing more consultants, more uh, leaders with MBAs and law degrees leading uh, Washington, D.C.'s FQHCs. Unity CEO uh, has a consulting background with McKinsey. Uh, Whitman Walker is run by a lawyer. Why are lawyers and consultants running healthcare organizations that serve underserved patients with federal monies? And okay. I think what we're seeing is it's all coming to bear. Yes. And, and do you or Dr. Sugarman have any idea of how much money Unity is spending on its top uh, uh, executives and also on these um, union busters uh, firms? It's obviously well, a lot. Of well, you know, it's certainly tens of thousands for Littler Mendelssohn, and over the course of a, say a year of bargaining, that that would probably reach into six figures easily. Um, and uh, um, uh, what was your second question about finances, uh, Joni? Uh, well, that was it. You know, how much? How much are they paying to pay? Oh, uh, oh, oh! The salaries of the CEOs. Uh, last we heard about the salary, uh, uh, Dr. Boyd, the CEO of Unity, she was making $450,000 a year, but I think that was two years ago. So I think we can safely assume that she's making more than uh, half a million dollars a year wow. at, this well, point, the at this point. Making, the doctors are making peanuts compared to the, what doctors uh, usually make. It's, it's, just, it's just really, um, it's just really horrifying. And one question I have, I don't know if either of you can answer this or if Dr. Chapman can, but uh, my understanding of the managed care organizations is that often a Unity patient has to be also signed up with a managed care organization, which is bringing in, as we mentioned, lots of money. So um, I don't know, Dr. Shugman, do you, do, you do you interact also with the managed care organizations at Unity or is that not too much. I, I don't feel uh, able to answer that question. <laughs> so, again, this is another basic question, which we should all know the answer to. But, uh, again, uh, district residents are paying from tax dollars uh, for to support th th these health care programs, and yet it is going down and down and down. Um, we have – oh, we only have a minute left right now, unless you want to stay on – a little longer past the break, but I also wanted to announce and share that Dr. Sugman is not only a very dedicated family physician, <laughs> she's also a dedicated activist, and we hope to have her on or record her uh, on. She's very active, um, Jewish Voice for Peace, standing up uh, against the genocide in Gaza. And just briefly in a minute, Kate, could you share with the listeners what you uh, have recently done uh, in support of Cori Bush. 
Yes, I spent two visits to St. Louis in the blistering heat, uh, knocking on doors to keep Cori Bush in office. She was targeted by an APAC funded smear campaign. And, um, you know, she's not only a champion for peace in Gaza, she's also a climate champion. Um, she has supported Climate Defiance, a group that my son started. She's just a champion for human rights, earth rights, uh, peace. And, uh, knock, I was knocking on doors, uh, up until election day in the blistering heat, uh, getting people to go out and vote for her. But unfortunately, she lost, but she is not yeah. giving up. Um, she is determined to take down APAC. We're all determined to take down APAC. Um, I've been a long time, uh, immigration rights, uh, activist working with, um, really thousands of asylum seekers, helping them in their asylum case. So, uh, we, uh, we have, we're, we're keeping busy. Yes, and, and just in, in a couple seconds, uh, I'm very proud to, or I, I want to share that you're also very active uh, with Jewish Voice for Peace and others to stop this genocide. So we thank you for that, Kate. And uh, again, if you, if you can stay on, please do. Otherwise, we're going to, one way or another, uh, have you back again. Of course, we're going to have carry on. We're going to take a uh, another what we call pitch break to encourage people to make well, a donation. I'm gonna, I'd like to donate right now. So can I, um, how do I donate so that it goes towards Heal DC? Um, I'd like to, I have the website. What do I do? <laughs> okay. Well, Joni, do you want me to jump in? And, yeah, yeah. and this way I can tell others um, how to do this. You can simply, Carrie, thank you, first of all. And those listening, if you want to make a donation like Carrie is doing right now, you can go to our website, WPFWFM.org. You can hit that red Donate Now button on the website. Then you'll see a drop-down menu. You ch if, if To Heal DC is not already listed there, you choose To Heal DC, and then it takes you through the steps of how much, et cetera, and how you want to make your donation. I'm going to donate right this minute. I'm walking to my computer. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. And as Joni mentioned, um, we do want to encourage you to make a pledge of support. We have Carrie's uh, donation coming in, but at this very moment, we need $700 still to make the goal for this hour. We have 18 minutes to do it, folks, and we can do this together. Never without you. You have sustained us for uh, since 1977, going on a uh, Oh, I'm bad with the math, Joni. I want to say 43 years. I could be wrong with the math. But since 1977, we have been people-powered. We have been upholding the vision of Lou Hill, who was a pacifist. Um, we heard about what happened with Cori Bush and APAC. And um, Lou Hill believed another world was possible and that people would donate to a media outlet that reflected their values. And certainly our values are, one, are, are ones of justice, of equity, um, of course, of peace, but you cannot have peace without these other two being present. And so you understand that as a listener to WPFW and as a listener of To Heal DC. So please make that call that makes a difference right now for Joni Eisenberg. She does such fine work. Joni, you do incredible work. And we want to celebrate her, celebrate this show. It's our summer pledge drive, our second day. So let's, you know, um, uh, go right in there and, and do the best that we can for Joni this morning. 800 dollars to go. Think about that sustaining pledge. It's a great way to give monthly. And, and we love it because we can then uh, forecast and, and plan um, because we know we have a certain amount coming in every month. And you just tell um, the phone representative that you want to set up a sustaining donation and they'll do it for you quick and easy. You can also do that on the website at WPFWFM.org. Again, $700 to go between now and the top of the hour, 16 minutes to do it. Joni, I don't want to take up a lot of your time yeah. um, with the, the <laughs> pledge, but we want to just make sure that people understand how important it is to support to heal dc um i can't get the i'm having trouble can you tell me the phone number one more time the number for all to call is 800-222-9739 and i can donate by i can tell i can use that phone number to uh, donate that's right. 800-222-9739. Absolutely, Carrie. All right. And I'm anyone else up. listening. I'm Kate. 
I'm Kate. Okay, um, I'm sorry. Thank you. That's okay. I'm uh, going to um, disconnect now from Zoom, and I'm going to call okay. that number right this minute. And Kate, just make sure you say you're donating to Heal DC, if you'd like to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have it all written down. I wrote down the, distru- okay, uh, the instructions. Yep, I'm going to call right this minute. Okay, terrific. Again, 800-222-9739. And Katia, one more time for the Cash app. Absolutely. That's dollar sign WPFWFM. It's a brand new Cash app. So if you have us already in your your um, Rolodex and Cash app, as it were, you know, you can pull up uh, places you've donated before. Please don't use the old one. Use this one. Replace it with dollar sign WPFWFM. Joni? Absolutely. And again, folks, um, we we need your support. If you are committed to uh, creating a world, world, a country that doesn't spend uh, billions, countless billions of dollars killing people, but we can live in a country that's committed to keeping people alive, then you need to support uh, this radio station. Uh, now, as we know, we're in a very a frightening time, frankly, and... Um, a donation of fifteen dollars a month. I don't know what that would come out to. Uh, you know, you don't have if you don't have a bunch of money in your uh, bank account, you can do it uh, as Chuck Hicks used to call it on layaway. And we give a shout out to Chuck Hicks, whose mom just passed and is always with us in spirit. Uh, you can make a pledge to 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 any of us, but we really need this radio station to be strong right now. We're in a frightening time. So um, thank you, Katia. Let's jump back in with Dr. Chapman. And again, you're listening to Heal DC. We're talking about the corporatization of healthcare, uh, how the the big guys, the the money, big money people are making more and more and more money off of uh, people being sick. And they're working to make sure that people, unfortunately, stay sick without the uh, care that that people need, uh, we see an increase uh, in the in this corporatization. As Dr. Chapman was just saying, he recently returned from the annual convention of the National Medical Association, where they are speaking out and going to be organizing uh, intensely in the coming years to help stop this corporatization. And Dr. Chapman, we have some good news from the National Medical Association. Apparently, the next president is going to be someone from D.C., as you were sharing with me. Uh, yes. Uh, so our former uh, chief medical examiner, uh, Dr. Roger Mitchell, uh, is the president-elect of the Na- National Medical Association. Uh, he's currently uh, uh, one of the uh, lead physicians at Howard University's uh, 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 hospital and um, uh, really involved in uh, just about anything and everything uh, in healthcare, including healthcare finance. Uh, so we're looking at a legacy uh, that is pretty clear. Uh, the association uh, with uh, the National Medical Association, Howard University, uh, the local chapter of the National Medical Association, MedCi of DC. Dr. Jesse Barber was president of uh, uh, both the National uh, Medical Association at at one point and uh, the local chapter. If you can imagine uh, the caliber of person that Dr. Uh, Barber was, Uh, uh, this man was the first board certified uh, African-American neurosurgeon in the country, but yet he was concerned about the homeless. Uh, You just can't uh, uh, put those two things together. Uh, And now when you draw a line uh, to uh, physicians like uh, Dr. Sugarman, you can see the relationship and the dedication. There's a straight line relationship uh, that has not changed in terms of uh, providers, physicians uh, wanting to provide the best services uh, and uh, uh, not necessarily as a money-making venture, uh, which, which is what healthcare uh, has uh, turned into uh, from uh, these corporations. So, so that's the battle that we're fighting. 
we're, we're really uh, uh, fighting for the legacy of, of persons like Dr. Jesse Barber, who taught generations of physicians. One of my classmates actually uh, went into neurosurgery uh, 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 and yes, others I, uh, that I know. So that's yes, what we're that, talking that, about. Yes, and I hate to cut you off, and of course, Jesse Barber is, is the reason we're on the air. He urged us to start this radio show. But we also, uh, I, I almost forgot, and it's very important, uh, Carrie Lane is on with us to tell, uh, share with the listeners about a very important gathering tomorrow. So we, we have a, about one or two minutes left, Carrie. Uh, tell us what's going on tomorrow evening. Yes, and, and I think to sort of uh, bring all of these very, very important points together, we, we're gathering tomorrow evening for a healthcare solidarity event uh, in support of Unity Healthcare Providers, uh, but but in addition um, uh, to healthcare in the, in the D.C. community in general. And so um, we are gathering at Sud House, D.C. Uh, from 5.30 to 9 p.m. tomorrow evening, Sud House, D.C., 1340 U Street Northwest. That's 1340 U Street Northwest, and there will be several, several um, there will be sister unions, there will be unity providers. <clears throat> I'll be there with the Union, the union of American Physicians and Dentists. And we're, uh, we're also going to have a lot of WPFW folks there. So to your listeners who've been listening to the station for years and years, um, this is a wonderful opportunity to actually meet uh, people like Joni Eisenberg or Dr. Chapman. <laughs> Um, and have a and uh, have a cocktail with them, and um, and we can gather in solidarity uh, because we do need community support to get leg- legislation passed, to pressure our uh, elected officials, to show support for uh, not just the unity providers, but um, other advocates in, in in the district who are fighting for uh, health equity and healthcare justice. So. Uh, what better way to do that than um, a, uh, a wine and cheese gathering at Sud House, D.C., 1340 U Street, Northwest, tomorrow evening from 5.30 to 9 p.m. Thank you very much, Carrie, and I hope to be there, although I'll be drinking a healthy drink, <laughs> as Dr. Watkins would want me to. But uh, we are very thankful for you, Carrie Lane, and for Kate Sugarman, and for Dr. Edwin Chapman, who, again, is a hero the people's hero for health care here in the city, following the footsteps of our Dr. Jesse Barber. Uh, I hate to be discouraged that we haven't gotten more pledges. Uh, again, folks, you know, I'm a volunteer, and all of everyone you hear is a volunteer, but we have paid staff, folks. We have a very, very small number of paid staff. I think it's five or six paid staff. We have a wonderful Magic Mike, who's our engineer. We have Katia Stitt. We have... Miyuki, we have uh, several other, uh, Vinnie Jack, several other we staff people. We need to be able to pay them. We need to be able to keep the lights on. Joni, Joni uh-huh. may I jump in? Because we're sure. actually doing quite well. If I can just uh, thank some folks. We all, we want to say thank you to from the Culture Shack in support of our dear Joni. Thank you so Aww. much. Thank you to Anonymous <laughs> out of Potomac, Maryland. Thank you for your generous pledge. And thank you to Vanessa Dixon out of Columbia, Maryland, a board Yay. member, putting her her uh, dollars where her heart is. Thank you so yeah. much, Vanessa. And we only need three hundred more dollars, Joni. We can do this. We have yeah, seven we minutes. I know you have to. I know you have to um, sign off, but we have seven minutes to go, folks. So even yeah, as Joni seven, is seven. saying her goodbyes and you're hearing the no, no, outro I'm, music, and you know what? Please, you know what? Katia, please, I want to. I want to share with you that uh, Vanessa Dixon. One of her biggest uh, champions was none other than Damu Smith. And uh, Vanessa was a leader in the fight to save D.C. General. And if I could just bring uh, Damu onto the airwaves, which unfortunately I can't, <laughs> he knew how to get you folks to go to the phone. So if you remember Damu Smith, uh, and he would, no holds word, he would make sure that we would get that. How much do we need, Katia? Well, we only need we only need 300, Joni, and I want to ask, Everyone, within the sound of our voices right now, please make that call right now that makes the difference so we can exceed this goal. We're so close. $300, 800-222-9739. Many of us remember Damu very fondly, and he was a strident, strident, Picture. right, supporter of all who were suffering injustice and, and across every issue. So if you 
understand that is what WPFW is about. If you understand that um, To Heal DC is right in that flow, is part of that river of life, 800-222-9739, or you can go online to WPFWFM.org. Uh, Joni, I'm going to give it back to you because I know you have to move out the way for our next program. But again, yes. one more time, $300, 800-222-9739. I am confident we'll do this, Joni. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kati, and thank you, listeners. Uh, keep keep those calls coming. Make a pledge in, in honor of an ancestor, one of somebody in your family, somebody on uh, PFW from the past, Gaston Neal, Knapp Turner, uh, A.C. Bird, Askia Muhammad, uh, Damu Smith, uh, Dorothy Healy. Uh, keep, uh, keep the spirit going and make sure that we can be strong WPFW needs to be strong as we roll into this next period where we have many threats uh, in this nation and around the world. So we need your support. We need WPFW to be able to strongly support Jazz and Justice Radio 24-7 and keep on rolling. Thank you, Magic Mike. Uh, Shout out again to Chuck Hicks. And uh, thank you, Mari. And let's go out with that song. Thanks to Lucy Murphy. Uh, go tell it to the nation about we need health care. Go tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care. The greedy corporations determine who survive. Can we give just the wealthy the right to stay alive? Go tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care. In hospitals and clinics, the poor are turned away. The system won't provide for the ones who cannot pay. Go tell it to the nation on Capitol Hill and everywhere. Go tell it to the nation. We all deserve health care.